Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 Crisis Management. This webinar is brought to you by the Baldrige Foundation Institute for Performance Excellence and our trustee members, the Baldrige Family, Adventist Health, and Stellar Solutions. Thank you for your support and generosity. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have questions, please submit them to the moderator in the questions box located on your control screen. Our guest presenters will answer questions during the roundtable segment of today's broadcast. We would first like to begin with a reminder that of our individual responsibility to help slow the spread, which has been extended by the President of the United States until April 30th. And we want to thank all of the healthcare workers and professionals across the nation, nurses, doctors, specialists, and their entire support system for your courage, dedication, and professionalism during this national crisis. You all have our deepest gratitude and respect. Here is today's agenda. After the introductions, we will have a guest panel roundtable discussion that will be facilitated and moderated by Ben Sawyer and myself, followed by questions from the audience. Then we will have a brief wrap up at the end. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to my good friend, Dr. Roger Spullman, the community leader of Muskegon County's COVID-19 response and a former hospital and hospital system executive. Roger. Hello, and I wanna thank all of you for taking time today to listen to this webinar. Uh, it's very interesting how this all started for me. Um, it was actually on Saturday, March 14th, which seems like forever ago, and it's just a little over two weeks. And I think that time is traveling. It's, a, it's like dog years, isn't it? Each day seems like a week. But it was only a couple weeks ago, and I got an email or a text at home from the county medical officer in the county where I live, Muskegon County. So the chief medical officer of the health department sends me a text and asks me if I would be willing to head up a community task force to deal with the COVID-19 response on behalf of the county health department and to bring together stakeholders in the health in the healthcare area of our county. Well, honestly, I was politely trying to figure out a way to politely say no or figure out a way to explain to my wife why I'd taken on another job. I'm just minding my own business trying to retire because I had been involved in healthcare, as you know, for, for decades, and particularly in this area, working for Trinity. And then I thought back to the previous week where I'd been introduced to this tool, Priority Pulse. Now, this tool was originally designed to be an executive education tool, but the uh, developers had figured out a way to pivot and turn this into a readiness tool with some help from the CDC and going through the guidelines and, and communicate, helping people communicate. I thought, this is perfect. So I didn't say anything about it, but I agreed to meet with the health department. And so I went Monday morning and met with the health officer, with the incident commander, with the administrator, the county administrator, the county executive, and a couple of other people. And, and honestly, these are wonderful people. They're very sincere, but it didn't take long to realize that they were really under-resourced for the role that they were being asked to play here. They were receiving, and I, got, I sat in on a phone call from the State Department of Health, they were getting information pushed down to them and it was honestly a very confusing, uh, mixed up kind of way. And then beneath them, they were getting requests from all over the place, from restaurants, from schools, from law enforcement, from churches, from union groups. Uh, everybody was being told, you're going to get these answers from the health department. And they were really, as I said, sincere folks, but under-resourced and unprepared to really manage this whole crisis as it was unfolding. And so when I, I started asking questions, I met with the, oh, the, uh, the chief of epidemiology for the county was in the meeting. And, and so I said, okay, what's happened so far? I started asking questions. So how many people have been tested? And uh, I was told the number and I said, well, 
what is the criteria under by which you're, the, these people are being tested and who's ordering the tests and what are the results? And we found out quickly that none of that was being captured. And they're, again, not, they're not lazy or derelict or unwilling. They just didn't know. They didn't have a system to put all this stuff together and answer questions. We were also, as I said, in the meeting with the county administrator, and he had just come from a meeting with all the county and the county commissioners, and they had questions. They were being asked by their constituents, what's going on? What are we doing to prepare? So this tool just seemed to be the perfect thing to implement, um, which we were able to do. We were able to get the tool in their hands. I told them about it, and they were excited about the possibility of turning what most of us on the call are familiar with in terms of a visual management room, which is a, a defined space in geography in our hospitals or in, in clinics, and put this uh, digitally in everyone's hand, in their pocket, so that they could instantly, everyone be on the same page with what's going on. And uh, it, it, one of the things that I, also encourage them to do was to immediately stop reporting on things for which they had no control whatsoever. It just created such a state of uh, anxiety and fear and uncertainty that uh, it was very making it much more difficult to deal with. And I said, why don't you instead figure out a way to report on things that you have done to prepare for this or things that you've done to respond and to create more confidence. And that too is something that could be put into this digital platform. So um, we're very fortunate because Muskegon, if you look at the map, is located on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan. We have all water to the west of us. So we're fairly isolated, if you will. We're not on your way anywhere because Michigan is a peninsula and it's not an international port. People aren't living on top of each other. But, uh, but, but it's, an, it's an ideal place, I think, to manage this communication. We also have a consolidated healthcare system. So there's one hospital system that uh, is in the area responsible for that whole catchment area. And, and so putting this in the hands of the hospital as well, and that's what we're working on so that they can have instant access to all the same information is a, a tremendous, tremendous help to all of us. Now, there are barriers, let's be honest. Uh, the, there are two things that are very difficult. One is that there's the tyranny of the urgent. It's really difficult to take the time because they're just being just blown away with all the demands placed on them and all the calls. So it's hard for them to look at the luxury of investing the time to learn this new system. It's not that difficult. It's very intuitive, very customizable, and it can be done with remote presence. It doesn't, you don't have to wait for somebody to show up to actually walk you through it. It can all be done remotely. But, um, but to, to have that opportunity to take a moment to look at it because it will provide solutions to some of the problems that they're encountering. The second thing is they had firewalls within their IT department that um, also had to be taken down to allow this platform to be used uh, across a lot of people. But we're working through that and uh, I wish I could say today, uh, I could wish I could look at the app. We may be able to within hours say how many people have been tested, what the status is. I happen to know how many people are in the hospital how many people are on ventilators, but this will all be contained on the app and uh, how many, just, just how many beds are available, how many vents are available. Um, so, but in terms of PPE, what, what's the status of supplies of PPE? So at any rate, this is a wonderful tool. It seemed to be perfect for what we were trying to do and um, we're in the process of rolling it out. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna turn this uh, section over to, uh, Jennifer Strahan, and Jennifer is the COO of SOAR, and uh, she's an expert at explaining how this all works. So Jennifer, take it away, please. 
Thank you, Roger. And I'm so glad that we are able to partner together with you guys in Muskegon County to help serve your community. Um, I, I wanna make this very practical for participants. So if you don't mind, I wanna start with a very simple question for everyone. And if you had to rate your organization's response to COVID-19 on a scale of one to 10, what would you give it? And there's no grade for this, I promise. Uh, it's just an opportunity for a quick reflection. Interestingly, when I was thinking about our presentation and discussion though, the thing that seemed the most appropriate in terms of a scale was actually a pain scale. Because I can't think of an organization who hasn't experienced some level of discomfort from all of this. COVID-19 has interrupted every ounce of normalcy that we previously had. And Roger just shared uh, with you guys some of the efforts and challenges that they faced in Michigan. And I would imagine that you can relate to just about everything that he said in some way or another. And talking about counties and health care systems or hospitals is unique because they don't shut down. So you're managing not only the struggle with COVID-19, but you're also maintaining day-to-day -day operations. So let's just put this into perspective of a hospital CEO for a minute, which Roger obviously can relate to for sure. And he started to allude to this. But obviously there's, there's a duty and responsibility to connect to the county, local and state government. But there's no doubt that you guys are also thinking about a lot of other things. Your patients, the required capacity that you have or may need to treat those patients, supplies, PPE, keeping your team safe and engaged in this process, keeping your family safe, the broader impact to social and community health, funding and future budget, and of course, just time. So resources are quickly becoming very overwhelming. CDC released an updated hospital preparedness checklist, but frontline team members just can't keep up with the pace of change right now. So COVID-19 introduced a lot of unexpected chaos in our world. And it goes without saying that managing chaos is hard. So since Roger referenced Priority Pulse, I, I wanna just take a minute to show it to you because I, I think it makes the most sense if you can actually see it in the context of an example. Um, Pulse is an action-based software, so it organizes three things. One, your strategic priorities. Two, it helps you to orchestrate your team action plans. And three, it helps you visualize performance results into a single accessible cloud-based resource. So we've customized our solution, as Roger mentioned, to support organizations who are managing COVID-19 in alignment with CDC standards. So I'm gonna focus on the healthcare aspect for just a moment because that is more of my background. Obviously it's directly related to the counties and I'll come back and, and connect the dots there in just a moment. If you're like most hospitals, you've already assigned an executive leader, you've created a task force as soon as this threat started to bubble up. Organizations now have moved from preparing for COVID-19 patients to proactive identification of those patients to prevent spread and also to management of both existing and potential patients as well as day-to-day -day operations. So the left side of the screen shows a few examples of how hospitals are responding, but I wanna call out two of these in particular that Pulse can support you with. One is how you host or support your daily huddles and communication flow, whether that's virtual or in-person. And then the second is automating and expanding your existing incident command center to enable virtual coordination. So I call these two out in particular because they're frequently implemented, but to varying degrees of success. So it, the other thing is even though I'm talking about healthcare, they're relevant actions for communities and other organizations as well. So let's walk through Pulse from the perspective of two individuals. One is a team leader, and then the second is an organizational executive. Um, in this case for hospital, I'm gonna use the example of a nursing director and a chief operating officer or COO, but relate this to anything relative to your own personal structure as well. Before I jump into Pulse, I just wanna be very real right now. Uh, as a team leader, no one has time. No one has to be easy. We have to have this easy to access, easy to use, and easy to share. Now is not the time to fumble around learning a complex tool. So let's dive right in. I wanna show you a couple, actually I think three screens I have to show you with Pulse. 
Um, here, you're looking at a team-specific screen and pulse. In this case, this is the screen for my critical care ICU director. Um, as a team or department leader, I'm responsible for three specific updates within Pulse relative to COVID-19. And just to stick with my huddle example, I'm going to say that these three things would be updated prior to my daily or shift huddle uh, with the broader organization. So the first thing I'm responsible to update are my team measures. I need to make sure I'm adding in the most up-to-date information. So um, again, Roger started to allude to this. Maybe it's the number of beds I've got available or occupied, the events that I have available, and events that are in, in uh, with mechanics being addressed. Um, it, whatever the case is, I can see it right here, access, click the blue icon, and I get a pop-up screen that helps me enter in my data. The second thing I'm going to update are all of the action items that I'm currently work, working on with my team. So that's important because I need to be able to see existing and potential barriers as well. And in one of the things that Pulse allows you to do is actually dive into the details to problem solve when needed by using an A3, which is a problem solving methodology within Lean. The third thing that I'm updating are my strategy overall items in, of, in terms of their status. So this is collectively created based on the information that's obtained from my team measures and my action items. If I've encountered a barrier, like maybe one of my events isn't working or a bed stopped working, or maybe I had staff call in, I can update my status right then. That's gonna kind of raise a flag to say, hey, I need help, or hey, we've got smooth sailing, we're, we're chugging along. So it has to be easy, so team members will use this. Everything they live in comes from this one screen for most team members. Um, they're able to access, again, their data, their measures and related to that data, rather, um, their A3s or action items, and then their overall status. So they're not having to fumble around on spreadsheets or shared drives and emails and a bunch of different huddles and meetings. It's now effective information. So when I do have to get together, I know exactly what I need and I can connect that information right away. I want to show you two other things. Um, one is that information is going to roll up to an organizational scorecard. You can customize these scorecards. In this instance, this is one specific develop, specifically developed for a huddle. Um, they can be customized by priority or team or status. Here as an executive, I need easy access to all of my team's updates so that I can focus on the most critical and relevant elements. So I want to know right after my team member is updating that information, it populates and I can see it immediately. There's a lot of information on the screen, so let me try to summarize this. Um, but this scorecard was designed as an example for, a, a, again, a quick team huddle uh, relative to COVID-19 items. And it's only pulling in red, or those items that are off track, or yellow warning items. It's not focusing on green items right here. Um, the reasoning behind that, obviously, is that's not the intention. You want to be able to problem solve in real time. You can access that information. It's just not the focus here. So as an executive now, I have a bird's eye view of everything. The yellow box indicates the information that was just entered in on the screen before. So I could see that update. And then I can also look at, again, the actions, the data, the progress related to COVID-19 by team leaders and or person responsible. And if there is an item like an A3, you can see the blue icon of the clipboard. You can click into that and actually see the details of that effort as needed. The last screen I just wanna show you is a dashboard. Um, Pulse gives you the easy capability to create custom dashboards to view overall trends by priority. In this case, obviously COVID-19 related measures but also functional area. So if I'm a system, maybe I wanna see my COVID-19 items by individual hospital or by a site if I'm a larger entity. Um, orchestrating all of this activity and the communication around COVID-19 for organizations is really complex. It's time consuming. And I would say one of the biggest challenges is it's just often lagging. And a friend and a mentor of mine once told me, you know, activity does not always translate to results we have to have the right activity. And that's where Pulse really tries to help you in the midst of this crisis and everything going on, how can we take out as much of the noise as possible 
we can't manage the chaos, but what we can do is try to dodge the chaos to create order. That's why the best way to respond in this type of situation is, is really thinking about how do we kind of slow down and connect the dots to everything. So this is just a simple example with hospitals and how you manage your teams and departments, but take this back to the community. So the example Roger talked about earlier with the efforts underway in Muskegon County, um, we've set up their site to support their public health team across the community. So that includes hospitals, it includes law enforcement, first responders, county directors, elected officials, schools, et cetera. And in the midst of that, you're managing all the different uh, elements of, of this chaos, but now you've got a handle on it. And so I'll flip to my last slide and I'll just leave it up for you guys to look at. But what I really wanna actually end on is a story just to put this in context for community as well. COVID-19 is very real in many ways beyond the walls of a hospital. So we recently partnered with another large county that's one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. They're just launching Pulse, so a very similar stage as Muskegon County. And as you likely know, schools closed approximately three weeks ago in a lot of different communities. One of the key concerns communities are facing right now is food insecurity for children not in school. This is also true for this county. Um, to understand just the magnitude of, of what this looks like with food insecurity, about 30 million students in the U.S. qualify for free or reduced lunch. When schools closed, there was no place for these kids to get their lunch, um, and about 33,000 kids didn't have lunch last week in this county because of pre-scheduled spring break. So in this location, school traffic was directed to food pantries. And those food pantries were not prepared for this influx of need. And on top of that, think about too, you know, running to the grocery store, you can barely get what you need, heaven forbid if it's toilet paper or something else, but there are certain supplies that are just limited due to so many people rushing to, to their own stores to stock up their own pantries. So the county just couldn't keep up with the community's needs because of this demand. Um, but, but also there's no coordination currently across these food pantries because they didn't typically interact in that capacity. Um, so the team in the community is managing this, is trying to run from pantry to pantry to understand and help address any barriers that pop up. So one of those recently was uh, there were, um, there were families, families that needed peanut butter at one of the local food pantries and they were out. And it turns out another food pantry on the other side of the town actually had plenty of peanut butter, but there was no way of knowing this. They had no transparency between those sites and they couldn't get their hands around it. So they just want to feed families. And, and it's a simple example, but it's actually what's driven them to say, hey, we need to get our hands around this. So they're going to be using Pulse to create an easy way to communicate and just track those pantry needs, but also broader needs within their community. Um, again, I know it's a simple example about peanut butter, but if, think about that example and relate it to the thousand other things or hundred other things in your community or organization. And if we if we don't manage this chaos, it, it, we will take some pretty hard hits on this as an organization or as a nation. And don't get me wrong, we'll, we'll make it through it, of course. I don't want to paint a picture of um, gloom and doom by any means. But we're using Pulse to make this a lot smoother and to help organizations make this smoother. But it's not about the tool. It's not a silver bullet. I don't wanna, I don't wanna make you think that, but it is about solving a giant problem. And this is a, where we're really excited to be able to work with Muskegon County and others to really help them solve this problem. So thank you for letting me share a few stories and a potential resource that might help you. And with that, Ben, I will turn it back over to you. Perfect. Fantastic. Way to go, Jennifer. Sounds good. Jennifer, thank you so much for that. And um, Scott McIntyre is the CEO of a large uh, services and consulting company in both the public sector and health system space. We had a couple follow-up questions that we wanted to get your input on, and I'll just pose them to you one at a time, if you don't mind. So firstly, could you please clarify your perspective as to how the Guidehouse and SOAR and Baldrige Foundation partnership is able and working to deliver real support 
to those organizations that are struggling to respond to the COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to everybody who's tuned in to this webcast today. It's it's a lot of important and timely information, and uh, we certainly hope it helps. Uh, you know, to answer your question, Ben, at GuideHouse, you know, we're we're here as a consulting firm and a business advisor uh, to work with health systems and other clients in both the public and, and private sectors to address important challenges, and we do that with innovative solutions like this. I think we would all agree. Uh, that at no time in modern history, certainly during our lifetimes, is that more important than during this pandemic. And to that end, you know, we're really pleased to partner with SOAR and the Baldrige Foundation to provide the type of crisis command and control application uh, that Roger and Jennifer just described. Uh, you know, from our perspective, it enables organizations to really do three things that are really critical right now. Uh, the first is to align with the latest CDC and FEMA guidance standards and practices. Uh, the second is to activate a well-orchestrated virtual and mobile response. And of course, the third is to achieve effective visualization, transparency, and coordinated action uh, consistent with the brief demonstration that you saw. Uh, you know, our perspective is, uh, I, I love the simplicity of this. Our perspective is that this is not the time to necessarily be taking uh, unnatural actions with your operation, possibly disrupting operations or even putting in place a, a uh, system or a process that could have some uh, some uh, contingent downstream uh, impacts to your organization in terms of disrupting process flow. Uh, this is a pretty simple, uh, very specific opportunity uh, to address these three things around alignment, activation, and uh, achieve visualization. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. And, and the second question is, what, if any, support is the partnership able to provide to the CDC? to further their really critical mission during this time? Yeah, sure. I mean, GuideHouse works with CDC and has for, for many, many years uh, as they work closely with state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, as well as public health partners uh, to respond to this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, our partnership at GuideHouse uh, with SOAR and the Baldrige Foundation further enhances our CDC support by helping to promulgate the CDC best practice guidelines uh, and empower a coordinated response by communities and healthcare organizations on the front line of the COVID-19 crisis. Got it. Thanks, Scott. Al? Our next question is a mix of questions that came in for Jennifer. Jennifer, Roger referenced Priority Pulse as the effective coordination tool that Muskegon County is launching to coordinate their complex response effort. Can you please connect the dots for the audience between community and hospital responses to COVID-19 and give us an example of how Pulse can support both. Sure. So I think the, the reality of what we're looking at here, again, is just the coordination of a lot of activity. And so a specific example for hospitals, as I mentioned uh, previously, could be relative to how do we coordinate all the different activity with our huddles. How do I had a an ED physician tell me just just the other day, you know, we have we huddle five times a day, and then as soon as we start to act on information that came out of that huddle, we're pulled back in and we're told to change and do something different. So it just becomes overwhelming for team members to where they cannot respond appropriately. Um, they don't know what to do, and so then they of course become a little bit stuck in where they're at. And think about this to the, the real world of where you're at today. It's a question of when I come in, if I'm a nurse, do I have the PPE I need to, to care for my patients? Do I have the masks that I need? If I'm a team leader, I need to be able to know that across my entire department. I need to be able to escalate things to the supply team or to my executive team if we're running short. And right now, a lot of the means for that is either waving your hands around or emailing people, which of course is overwhelming for just the how, how bombarded email can be, instead of having a single accessible location to where you can access it. So if I'm rounding on my team or if I'm rounding across different sites in my, my organization, um, I can see that information. And whether I'm virtual or I'm there on site, I have everything I need right away. So again, if it's you know specific to supplies, vents, equipment, um, sh staffing shortages, it's all available right there. But if it's a community, is it how I'm accessing and information with my schools, my first responders, um, government updates, things of that nature. So it can really be across the board in whatever is sets the stage for that relevant and timely requirement right then and there. Perfect, thank you, Jennifer. 
Our next question comes in for Dr. Rulin Stacy. Rulin, as a former hospital and hospital system CEO, what challenges do you see in a crisis like the one we are in, and how can leaders best respond to both now and later? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Al. I appreciate that. I I, I want to again call out what Scott has said about the current uh, the the current response and the ability to to access the the framework that uh, CDC is providing through FEMA. This is a, a a structure that healthcare has never we've we've never gone through anything like this. We've we've had tornadoes and hurricanes and other natural disasters, but for us it's it's ongoing. And rightfully we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to navigate those waters. One of the things as I talk to some of my colleagues around the country is that we're talking about is what happens the next day after COVID. What what how do we make sure that we prepare now? We, we provide the best care available right now. We don't sacrifice anything, but we start thinking about what happens next. How do we get our, our costs under control? For example, our revenue, we've all taken a hit on revenue. It's going to be very, very hard to recover from that. And uh, we've many in the industry have relied on our foundations and non-operating income but that's going away now with the market going down. So I, I think that we should all pause and take a time to think about what are we gonna to do to get our cost structure in line? How are we gonna treat our uh, uh, patients in the future? How are we gonna access our patients? Our, the digital front door has changed now instantly forever. And how are we gonna be able to be ready for that? And I talked to some colleagues what are we going to do to take care of our employees? This is like they've gone to war. These these are now veterans, I think, really. And and how are we going to treat them in the future? It's it's going to be an ongoing discussion for all of us. Thank you, Roland. Our next question comes in for Russ Branzell, the CEO of the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives. Russ. As you've talked with healthcare information technology leaders from across the nation and around the world, what are your observations regarding the benefit of a standardized deployment and reporting system? Well, I think Roland said it well when he said this is like a hurricane, but I was just talking to a, a very dear friend of mine over the weekend in Southwest Florida who actually was a brand new CIO uh, when the last hurricane hit, Irma. He said, every morning I wake up and I feel like Irma hit every single day now for three weeks straight. And you haven't even fixed what was broken yesterday and what's coming at you yesterday, and you have a whole new set of requirements and problems. And what has occurred during this short period of time, even though we've known about this for a while, is I would even say to our healthcare leaders and workers out there is, is not, it's just absolutely miraculous. What has occurred in about a three week period is probably about five to 10 years of healthcare change all without taking people along the way, even though they're having to change quickly. If you think about it, thousand-fold increases in teleworking and remote working in people that have never even done that before. Um, hospital, city, county, regional, and state surveillance systems, now national surveillance systems, all needing daily and new reporting that never existed before. So the number, and I could go on for the examples and examples and examples of this that I'm hearing from people around the world, what really we're seeing now is a influx of requirements and requests that often just overwhelm not just IT departments, all departments within hospitals, health systems, counties, first responders on a daily basis. And having talked to some of our leaders in some of the biggest cities and some of the hardest hit cities, uh, it is truly a, a, a daily battle to just get what needs to get done that day done. Not while having to deal with, at the same time, all the requests that are not being met. And so, as you look at this, the concept of centralized operational control, centralized transparency in all the requests and issues, nothing could be better to help. And I was part of an organization previously uh, that was one of the recognition recipients from a Bolger perspective. And I almost remember to the day, if not the month and year, when we went to a centralized balanced scorecard. And, and I know 
uh, Jennifer simplified some of the stuff that she mentioned earlier, I'll even more simplify it. When we went to a centralized balance scorecard, an operational tool where we could see everything in an organization, every requirement, areas that need to focus, it gave us something that we never had before, and that was complete organizational awareness and alignment. And most importantly, we were allowed to give our actions on a daily basis to the things that were most important. What we're hearing from organizations that are doing well during this, and I don't want to be a doom and gloom person either, I think there are great organizations doing great work out there every day. Some need some help, no doubt about it. And I think if we can really focus on operational tools and things that we can help them with, whether it's a mask or whether it's a tool, anything we can provide them right now in this battle, we should be doing. Thank you for that, Russ. So uh, we want to ask next Dr. Charles Peck, who's a partner at GuideHouse. Um, Chuck, you had significant experiences as a physician and a previous health system CEO in managing crises like this. Can you please share your insights from that experience and how it has shaped your response particularly now as the co-leader of our shared task force. Sure, thanks, Ben. <clears throat> so as Ben mentioned, um, I'm gonna be very uh, pragmatic and tactical here for a second. Um, and, and this is uh, within the context of having been the leader of one of the four regional health systems in the state of Georgia during the Ebola crisis. Um, first of all, I, I, want, I do wanna emphasize something Ruland said I think it's really, really important that we all provide um, that our frontline workers are economically protected if we're able to do that and let them know that. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that to start. I also just want to put out the concept of what I'll call slowing down to speed up. We, you know, we come in, everybody, I don't care who's on the phone and what business you're in, but we all come in every day and it's really just all about crisis management which means we're spending 80% of our time in the whirlwind when we really be when we really need to be spending 80% of our time focused on trying to deal with what's right in front of us. And so I think stopping and slowing down for a bit and really thinking about some of the key things and strategies that we all need to be doing um, as hard as that is, is really important. So let me just uh, quickly talk about four of what I think the key strategies are to be successful, again, it doesn't matter what, what business you're in. Uh, first is you know having the right strategy to begin with. A second is being able to actually execute that strategy. Third is having what I'd call a, a flat and responsive organizational structure. And then finally, having the right culture, um, which really to me in, means in this, in this environment, particularly empowering people on your front lines to be able to make decisions and have the information they need in order to be able to make the right decisions. So, you know, in healthcare, when it comes to the strategy, you know, we want to make sure that whatever's happening, that we have the patient at the center of everything we're doing. We obviously want to save as many lives as possible. We want to make sure that we have safe care, uh, including for all of our caregivers. And above all, you know, despite all those things, we've got to find a way to maintain fiscal stability. If you're in education, you know, how do we keep our teaching our students? You know, if you're in law enforcement, you know, how do I know what neighborhoods have high degrees of infection? And, you know, as I'm going through those neighborhoods, how if I knew that, how could I best help some of those individuals who are, you know, locked up in their homes and needing help? In terms of executing the strategy, you know, how am I going to stand up a command center? Um, what are the key positions that I need in that organization in order to allow for this communication? Do I have people that can help me manage project needs as we go through this? And do I have structured processes in place that allow all the people that are working for me to know what to do and how to do it, whether it's finding a pallet of peanut butter um, or N95 masks? In terms of organizational structure, some things that I don't know that people have been thinking a lot about, but you know, if I do have some sort of a command center in my organization or a way that I'm helping people um, work through this, what if one of those command centers has somebody come in who's COVID positive? Do I, do I have the ability to have a duplicative structure so that I don't miss a beat and I have to, beat and have to tr you close that entire center down? Do I have the communication tools that I need like Pulse? Um, do I have the ability to triage 
uh, people and product if I need to do that. And you know, something that I found that people haven't thought about at all, and this is particularly important in healthcare because of, of all the, the laws around personal health information, et cetera. You know, if I've sent a, a number of my employees home to work, do I have the right cybersecurity in place in my network to make sure that whatever information in my organization I'm passing around through the web is protected? Am I, am I developing things like daycare for my employees so that they can be available and as productive as possible? And then finally, in terms of my culture, have I empowered staff to make the right decisions? Do they have the tools and the information available? Do I have somebody who's really focused on the health of my employees and able to deal with things that come up that would potentially prevent one of the few employees that I have that isn't infected or that's still on the job to be able to do their job maximally? Have I provided for overnight accommodations for people? Those sorts of things set a tone for the culture in the organization that's really, really important today. So finally, I think that you know the ability to really focus on the right things, to have the, the tools available to be able to communicate and have decision-making really focused on the right things and being able to execute whatever my business or company is um, and having a tool uh, available that allows people to see what's happening real time through my organization and slowing down to put that sort of thing in place along with the others I've mentioned. I think that's really, really important. Thanks, Thank Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate that. Uh, Russ, our next question came in for you from the field here, and it centers around this. Uh, why is Mike Pence, the vice president, uh, sending a letter to hospitals requesting a daily 5 p.m. Excel spreadsheet for COVID-19 testing results when most hospitals either have Epic or Cerner? And why do you think that they're not using it? Do you... Um, what are the EHR vendors in this setting doing? Yeah, I know. I've talked to just about all the CEOs or lead people for all the major EMR vendors that are out there. And uh, you're right. Um, at this point, it may be a reception issue, not a transmission issue. In almost all cases, hospitals and others can convey almost all this information electronically in almost every single case. Um, and so in many cases, it may be a reception issue. I know for a fact, working with some of the leaders in CDC, uh, they're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about a billion dollars behind in their surveillance systems. And we've been trying to help them through Congress and other actions to try to get the money they need to update their systems to be able to accept this. In some cases, some of their systems are 10, 15 years old and uh, not able to report the way they should or receive the way they should. So in most cases, um, and again, there's dozens and dozens of EMR providers out there in there, almost all, if not all, have the ability to do centralized reporting, uh, whether that's up through their states, whether that's directly um, to the uh, federal level, which we've done in other environments that were mentioned even earlier. So in some cases, it seems like the simplest thing to do. They drop down to an equivalency of paper, Excel, I just get that reported and somebody crashes it really quick because we are in a bit of chaos management. Somebody doesn't have the time to sit down and look at this. But this does beg the question and really more of an action, as Ruin said earlier, what do we do to make sure we have this way it should be done for the next crisis after this? And I'm not trying to belittle where we are today. We need to focus on that. But there are lessons to be learned out of this that we need to solve because we had the exact same thing with Zika and others a few years ago, and we didn't learn the lessons we should have. Thanks, Russ. As we close in on the hour, I would open it up to the panel for any comments based on what we've discussed here today. Well, this is Russ. I'll just add one quick, quick note here on what we were hearing from the field and rehearing again for this, and that is, Anything we can do to reduce the noise for them at this point so they can focus and focus on things like we've talked about today would be massively beneficial. And that could be anything, lack of emails. I talked to one person that said they got over 500 solicitation emails in one day, people trying to push things to them, sell things to them to solve stuff today. Uh, and I will just offer up our organization, Chime. We have a landing site for COVID-19 where people can put anything for others to go back, especially our members, to 
to look at. And we're in collaboration with almost all the other associations to do the same thing, to try to reduce the noise for the field so they can focus. Uh, great partners like Guidehouse are putting all of their tools and solutions out there. So there's one place for everybody to go look at instead of receiving 500 to 1,000 uh, solicitations in a day or in a week. Al, this is Ruland. Can I ask a question of Scott? Absolutely. So I'm just curious to know, Scott, what the the your work in the past decade with FEMA in in other settings outside of healthcare can help healthcare, and what can healthcare teach FEMA? Are there is there any of that cross fertilization that you care to discuss? Yeah, Rowan, I sure will. Uh, you know, the word unprecedented gets used a lot during this crisis for, for a reason, and obviously FEMA's mission contemplates a number of different kinds of disasters, but nothing like this has, has challenged them before, right? And you see some of the remarkable successes they're already having, like uh, the, the build out of the hospital in New York in this past week with the Army Corps of Engineers, but also the fact that they will be uh, clearly uh, taking a role that you would almost say is commensurate with the role Treasury had during the financial crisis in 2008 uh, through 2010 uh, as being a key part of the CARES Act. Uh, we're already seeing and, and we are in fact working uh, with health systems in helping them understand and navigate the FEMA process. Uh, as, as you probably know, we've worked with FEMA for a number of years as have other companies in understanding the disbursement, the controls, uh, the audit trail, uh, even the uh, you know the, the the unfortunate necessity of having to provide con congressional testimony on the back end of this, and there'll be plenty of that uh, in the aftermath of this pandemic. Uh, but yeah, FEMA is going to be a key player, and the ability to uh, work with FEMA as a health system in in terms of, of getting compensation, getting uh, some uh, active uh, relief during the you know under the Stimulus Act is going to be critical, and and already health systems are starting to do that. A great observation. Any others? Jennifer, one of the questions that we got from multiple sources was, as we wrap up here, can you please share with the audience how they can connect with SOAR to learn more about Pulse? Because a number of people who are out there in the audience, this is the first time that they're hearing about Pulse and the tool. Yes, of course. So individuals can go directly to SOAR's website uh, where you can see how to contact us and it's www.soarvisiongroup.com slash COVID-19. Uh, but if I, if I may, I'd like to add, you know, the goal of this partnership between Guidehouse, Baldridge Foundation, and SOAR is really to extend coordinated management and support organizations as you're fighting the good fight. Um, we know you're facing challenges like never before and we just want to be able to work with you guys to support that effort to address whatever barriers whether it's cost it operations again time you know to get you up and running we we're partnering with organizations to help them within a matter of a couple of days to be fully on it and trained um, so that you're not bombarded by again i think you brought up a really great point there are a lot of solutions a lot of things that are out there to support organizations um, and if this is the right one for you we just want to be a, a way to support you and all the frontline heroes thank you jennifer as a reminder today's webinar and slides will be posted tomorrow on the baldridge foundation website and once again, we would like to thank the Institute's trustees, the Baldridge family, Adventist Health, and Stellar Solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our broadcast for today. Please stay safe, and may God bless each and every one of you and your families. Thank you.